Hi, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm with the AWS security team. I'm here with Neha, who's from our automated reasoning group. And the clicker works. So it's our goal to build and operate secure services for our customers. And if we're going to do that, we need to define what we mean by secure. So most people start with a, a colloquial definition, something like you've got there on the top. Uh, continued employment is always a, a good sign that you're doing something right. But this isn't really a good definition of secure. And so you're, you're going to work down towards something like we have on the bottom of the slide here. You not only need to stop the bad things from happening, but if that's your only goal, you're going to invest in cement mixers and wire cutters. You're not going to build useful systems. And so it's not just that bad things don't happen, it's that good things do happen. And so th this is where a lot of people wind up. This is where I was a few years ago. Then. I wound up with a much more structured and formal definition of secure. And you can see it there on the slides. What changed? How, how did I arrive here? Well, let me tell you. I do security. My job is super hard, and I'm really good at it. And this is clearly as good as it gets, right? You do the security things, and your systems get better. Done. Well, we had a couple people show up. Uh, Byron was the first, Neha followed quickly, and they were spouting off all of this crazy stuff about how they had this magical, mystical, mathematical stuff, and, you know, they, they'd applied it to these problem spaces, but, I mean, how hard could it be to apply it to security? I mean, it's just more stuff, like, we'll, we'll just do our stuff with your stuff, and then we can do security. And it sounded completely improbable and illogical and impossible, but we took a leap of faith, and we hired a few of these people. And I can tell you that they weren't completely right, but they also weren't completely wrong. Let's take a look at how our thinking has evolved here. So we've got a computer. A modern computer is an incredibly complicated thing. Layer of layer after layer of software running on top of really complicated hardware. But if you're either naive or an optimist, you can convince yourself into thinking that you understand what this machine is doing. At least the slide is pretty simple. But that's not a useful computer. The whole point of pretty much any system is to provide some service to some set of people. And so after we introduce humans to the system, only the most naive of us could possibly think that we had any understanding of the entire system. The diagram here is still pretty simple, though. Surely we can still reason about this system, or at least an idealized version of this system. But none of us actually build that system. The business wants features. Customers want us to fix bugs. The CEO just read an article in Wired, and the press release is already out, so you'd better get coding. The nice, simple diagram quickly gets replaced with a much more complex one. Your ability to look at the diagram and fool yourself into believing that you can reason about it is dwindling. And, of course, we've got a sample architecture here. We've got a, a couple of web servers that are connected to the internet. The web servers also connect to back-end servers, and we have a bastion that allows us to SSH in to administer these servers. Uh, SSH traffic is shown in orange here. One of the security invariants we want to maintain is that all SSH traffic from the internet to the backend servers goes through a bastion. In this case, it's easy to check this by hand. We can just iterate across the boxes and see. Uh, we can just enumerate all of the SSH paths from the internet, and we're, we're good. We've, we've validated our invariant. But no real system is static. Your system is going to grow. You're going to add hosts. Most of the changes to your network are going to be in line with your intentions. But how sure are you that all of them are? And everywhere I've ever worked, we've had this person. Usually their name was different, um, but th th these things happen. And it's entirely possible that they were working out of the best of intentions at the time. You know, the, the system was on fire. There was an emergency. Like, this was the only way to get new capacity online. But we've now broken our SSH invariant. And in this case, it's super easy to spot here. I mean, I've labeled it for you, but even if I hadn't labeled it, it's easy to spot the place where we're not maintaining our invariant. If you have a large application and you use one of the automated application discovery programs, you're going to wind up with a diagram like this. Uh, we have this diagram for the Amazon.com retail website, and we call it the Death Star diagram because literally that's what it looks at. It's, it's this giant gray and black sphere that provides absolutely no data to the reader. Um, can you spot the unwanted SSH traffic in this diagram? 
Bob's desk doesn't stand out at all here. So we're picking on networks here to motivate this, but networks aren't special. Every system that I've worked with has gone through this. You've got certain invariants you want to maintain in your permissions policies. They start out simple. Over time, you add features, you add teams, you add functionality, and they get more complicated. Interprocess communication, that web server that we're treating like a black box, what's actually running on it? How many processes are there? How do they communicate? Code. Code is, uh, any, any, any real code base, any non-trivial code base that's been used in for production for years is an archeological dig. Electrical systems, any industrial site, and electricians are incredibly, incredibly precise and careful, but you look at a data center that's been in operation for decades, it's very hard to validate that the electrical system is exactly what's documented. I own a couple of old trucks, um, houses as well. It turns out that all previous vehicle owners and previous homeowners are terrible. They do clever things, and it's only after the home inspection and the, the paperwork has been signed that you learn, like, oh, wow, that electrical panel, that's interesting. And so all systems go through these evolutions over time. So what's a security person to do? And a key realization is that all security problems are violated assumptions. And so we can either try and violate some assumptions and do this ourselves proactively, or we can try and spot our assumptions, try and spot our blind spots and remediate them. So penetration testing. This is a, a time-honored security technique. Um, if it's 1996 and you're behind on your OWASP top 10, you just lost your users table. This is a creative act. You didn't expect SQL snippets in the username field. Someone violated an assumption that you had, an implicit assumption, one that hopefully you didn't write out. And hopefully the person that violated this is someone that you're paying that's gonna give you a nicely wrapped up finding and give you a chance to fix it. But this is a creative act. This is, this is someone putting together thoughts that no one has ever put together in that way before. Humans love exploring space. Uh, the space that we're exploring is not nearly as photogenic or as exciting. If you know what a finite state machine is, this is the, the, the model you should have in your head. So we've got a system, and it has, supports two operations, increment A and increment B. And so we start off in some node where A is 0 and B is 0. And there are these transitions in the system after calling either increment A or increment B. And every single state that's possible in the system is going to be represented here, and only the states that are reachable in the system are going to be linked in. So for example, this state where A and B have very large values, there's many paths that lead from the starting node to this node. You can reach this state. However, the state here where B is negative 1, if we assume arbitrary precision integers, you can't reach this state. This is an unreachable state. There's no sequence of inputs that leads from the start to this one. Security problems are all assumptions about which states are reachable, and then those assumptions are broken. So let's look at a couple more examples. Negative three mathematicians walk into a bar. You're not expecting a negative number. Maybe you do some interesting pointer arithmetic and scribble over something important like the stack frame. Uh, do you know what happens when you cast an unsigned number to a, uh, a signed number to an unsigned number? It turns into a very large unsigned number. So you may be checking to make sure that the number of mathematicians is less than eight, but then you cast this to an unsigned number, you're off the end of your array. All sorts of exciting things can happen. This is just a string of ASCII characters. It's perfectly safe to have this in a PowerPoint slide. Uh, this is a favorite of pen testers everywhere. You stuff this line in literally every entry box, in every field, in every application you can find, and eventually someone's going to get a little pop-up that says pwned. This is a JavaScript injection attack. People weren't expecting JavaScript in some place in their application. You violated that assumption. This last one here is Heartbleed. It's a trivial bug to exploit. The author of the bug never expected the claimed message length and the actual message length not to match up. This was an assumption that they made. Violating the assumption gets you Heartbleed. So the problem is that there are limits to human creativity. Some person sat down and looked at this software, looked at this code, thought about things that they could do, and came up with a clever attack. And we've all been the beneficiary of this. Our software has gotten better, our systems have gotten more resilient, but it would be arrogant for us to think that our pen testers have thought of every possible attack. So how do you handle the stuff you don't yet know about? Well, fuzzing, fuzzing is awesome. 
Um, I really like fuzzing. We have a cloud, and so it's pretty easy to spin up a bunch of machines and start fuzzing. So the realization is that most unexpected states lead to invalid execution, which is a fancy way of saying crashing. Unexpected input can lead to unexpected states. That seems pretty obvious. So let's generate random input to the program and just do this constantly and wait for crashes. And then when the machine crashes, you look at the input that you fed it, and you're like, why did this input reach this state? And if you're smart, and there's a ton of research that's been done on this, you, you analyze the code or you watch, uh, you, you wanna penetrate very deep into the logic tree of the code with your fuzzer. You don't wanna get stuck up in the, the error conditions at the beginning. And so may, maybe you, you guide the random inputs a little bit. But the state space that we're talking about here is massive. That trivial example that I showed, where you could just increment two integers, if you multiply through the total number of spaces that are possible, is literally infinite. You're never gonna explore that with random inputs. Let's go back to the networking example here. Um, you know, the box under Joe's desk. Well, the glorious thing is that there are no dusty corners in the cloud. You can't have a box under Joe's desk in the cloud. Nothing is hidden here. It's all explicitly described in our APIs. The design of the system is not just a picture or a document. It is actually the programmatic implementation of the network. This means we can query the design at any time. We can listen for changes to the design, and the design creates the implementation. So we know everything on the network, and we can know it again at any time for just a couple of API calls. Now I have all the data, actual ground truth for the network. I can do the analysis and verify that I have the network I wish I had, right? So we're, we're gonna go through, and you know, let's say I've got some number of accounts, and each account has some number of VPCs, and then each of those VPCs has some number of subnets, and the subnets have ACLs, and then there's security groups, and routing tables, and instances. Okay, now I've enumerated all of the network interfaces, and now for each of those network interfaces, I have to ask the question, what happens when I send traffic with a given protocol and port? And, and we can keep going here. This is just describing a single instance. And so if we go through and we assign reasonable numbers to all of these, um, you multiply through, and you get this massive number, nine billion and some. And you're, you're looking at this and you're saying, Eric, nine billion, really? It's that 65,000, like surely we can collapse that. But there's non-trivial complexity in here. Ports less than 1,024 behave differently than ports greater than 1,024. Are you sure it's safe to collapse it? And we're not even talking about the other end of the IP con connection, the, the two to the 32 possible IP addresses that could be on the other side. And these boxes are stateful. Like, what about previous packets that have traversed them, that have perturbed the state on the box? And so when you start adding in that complexity, you realize that exploring this state space by driving it randomly or pseudo-randomly, it's very hard to do that exhaustively. Even in the cloud, I can't generate that much network traffic. So trying to violate assumptions is awesome. You should continue to invest in it. But what if we try and spot our assumptions? So we're gonna do some threat modeling. This is another time-honored security technique. Um, we take a model of our system, in this case, our uh, well-worn network diagram, and for each link in the diagram, we ask ourselves a series of questions. And Stride is one of the popular frameworks. You can use whatever you want. The problem is that this is an abstraction of our actual system. And asking these questions, you're supposed to actually think about them, not just shoot from the hip and go with your gut, but actually think about what the implications are to your system. We regularly have people learn interesting things about their designs by going through this exercise, but this is an abstraction from the real thing. It's, it's great, but it's still done by humans. What, what does link in this diagram mean? Is that where traffic flows or where we expect traffic to flow, or is it literally the only places traffic can flow? There's no line between those two web servers. Is that because we don't expect traffic between the web servers or because we actually deny traffic between the web servers? I don't know how many times I've had someone find a flaw in their own system by doing this exercise, but I've also seen people say, that wasn't accounted for in our threat model when the pen tester hands them a finding. So just as with fuzzing and pen testing, you can keep doing this at finer and finer levels. You can keep investing forever, and you're never ever gonna get to the end. And so we've almost got a magic recipe here. Humans manually exploring, this, this is truly fun. This is pen testing. It is the best job in security and you should try it sometimes. Basically, someone is paying you to go break stuff. Even if it's your own stuff that you get to break. Like, you, you should really do this. It's a ton of fun. The, the inner eight-year-old wreaking havoc across the network, it is glorious. But it's slow. Um, fuzzing is also great. 
illuminating. I've never failed to learn something by fuzzing. Not, not, it's not exhaustive, it's slow. Uh, if you model the system, you, you align a bunch of the complexity. You're not dealing with all of the, the underlying complexity of the actual implementation, and you learn things about your system again. But once again, you're at some level of reserve. You're not dealing with all of the system. And so if we dive too deep on the threat model, we get that combinatoric explosion. We can't ask the stride questions of all of the things that we should. But if we're too far away, it's a meaningful loss of fidelity, and it doesn't actually provide the protection we want in the implementation. But the full state of AWS is captured in the APIs. We are so close. There's just one missing ingredient. And so that missing ingredient turned out to be automated reasoning. Rather than exploring this state space, rather than trying to traverse all of those links in that finite state machine, whether it's manually or via automation or via fuzzing, automated reasoning takes the definition of your system and captures it as a series of logical statements, axioms about how the system behaves. It constructs a logical model of your system programmatically, driven by the actual configuration of your system, not your beliefs about the configuration of the system. Then, using robust formal methods, you can prove things about the behavior of the system. Uh, test every single link in the entirety of that state space, enabling you to make positive statements about your system, about the things that it might do, the things that it will do, and the things that it absolutely will never do. So to tell you more about this, and what we've done with it, as someone who actually knows what they're talking about here, Neha. Thanks, Eric. Um, hi, my name is Neha, and I, I did a little bit of the state space explosion, uh, exploration problem uh, in my previous job, and that's when, uh, I started in security. Uh, this could be another talk about the conversations Eric and I had about automated reasoning and security. But before we talk about automated reasoning at AWS, I want to talk a little bit about the early days of unautomated reasoning. Because the state space explosion problem is not new, and it's not specific to computers either. And for that, we want to take a small step back in history. This is Euclid. He was a mathematician in 300 BC. And he proved the Pythagorean theorem that says that the square of the side opposite the right angle is equal to the sum of the uh, square of the two sides. So how did Euclid approach this problem? Did he fuzz the triangles? Did he audit all the triangles? Did he do an APSEC review for the triangles he knew about to study its threat model? I mean, hypothesis? Or did he analyze all the logs for all the triangles that he ever knew about? Spoiler alert, he did none of those. He used symbols and geometry to reason about triangles, to reason about many concrete values that were represented in those symbols. And the reasoning was not automated, but it did reason about all possible triangles, infinite of them. And we come today, and there is no conversation. Hey, did you find a triangle that violated the Pythagorean theorem? It just doesn't exist. And that's what the power of proof gives us. So, Coming back to the modern world, computers aren't built out of triangles. And it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. Even the most complicated programs are just a bunch of zeros and ones. And the math of zeros and ones is called Boolean logic. A core problem in Boolean logic is called checking satisfiability. So what does it mean to satisfy a formula? It means can you find an assignment to the variables in your formula that make it true. And this is a known hard problem. It was the first problem that was proven to be NP-complete. And what does it mean to be hard? It means that there's actually a mathematical proof of its hardness. If somebody comes and says, hey, I have a really hard problem, theoretically hard, and I've shown that I can reduce it to checking satisfiability, everybody in the community, all the scientists will go, oh, OK, clearly you have a hard problem. And because it was theoretically hard, the importance is like scientists in the past 30 years have really focused on coming up with clever and efficient ways to solving them. There are things called like conflict-driven clause learning, unit propagation, as well as nonlinear backtracking. So I want to provide a bit of intuition of why the problem is hard and how it can be solved efficiently. So Eric talked about state spaces. 
So the state space of checking satisfiability is determined by the number of variables in your formula. So if you have 20 variables, your state space is about a million. If you have 30 variables, your state space is about a billion. And techniques like testing and fuzzing try to solve this problem by assigning concrete values to the variables and moving forward. But the state space is just too large to cover it, to cover the entire space. While automated reasoning techniques work backwards, and they keep asking the question, how do I cause the result that I want? And it turns out, with some clever algorithms, there are efficient ways to solve this problem, and they are implemented in tools and engines called SAP solvers. So now that we have an efficient way of solving the problem, what do we do? We actually do the most human thing ever. We make the problem harder. And we replace each Boolean variable, which is just has a value of zero or one, with a formula of its own. And the SMT formulas have variables of types integers and arrays and strings. And now each of these expressions have a massive state space of its own. But we humans are very resilient creatures. We, make, we, we create problems, but then we also endeavor to solve them. So the, the techniques and the algorithms to solve SMT formulas are implemented in tools and engines called SMT, SMT solvers. And SMT has been used in a variety of applications. Uh, it started with hardware verification, with uh, verifying ALU design, a lot of work in aerospace applications. In my previous job, I worked on verification of collision uh, avoidance detection systems, uh, as well as medical devices, infusion pumps. And now in the cloud, because the same, same elements, the same exhaustive state space problems exist in the cloud. And we started by looking at access control, because access control is an important pillar in security. It's about how you connect to your applications, how you connect to data. And the two aspects of access control we really focused on was network reachability and access control policies. And I'm gonna talk through what we did in both of these spaces. I'm gonna start about talking about networks. So we built a service that allowed us to reason about EC2 networking, ask questions about it. And it was about doing a static analysis of the network we did not send a single packet across the network. And so that allowed us to analyze networks and answer questions about networks that hadn't been deployed. So let's look at a very simple example for a three-tier web application. So we create a VPC, and we want to put each of our tiers into e its each own subnet. We want to put a security group around the data server so that it can only talk to the application servers. We want to put a security group around the app server so that they can only talk to the web servers and the data servers, and that the web servers uh, have an internet gateway so that they can talk to the internet. So are we done? No, because as Eric said, things grow, our network will grow. We will add another VPC and put a peering connection between them so now these two VPCs can talk to each other. There's gonna be more applications, so it will keep growing more. You'll have new teams joining, growing. Maybe your company had an acquisition, so suddenly the scale has grown more. New customers, new use cases, new businesses, and the, the same question, if I told you that there's some misconfiguration here, how long would it take you to find it? A, f a few hours, a few days, a couple of weeks? And the only thing constant in a network is change. So as soon as you've found the problem, you have to rinse and repeat, do the same process. So you need, what has changed about your VPCs, your ACLs, or your subnets? And you have to keep repeating the process. You want it continuous. So we built a service called Tiros. It allows you to answer the question, did I build the network that I intended? And we can ask questions. Who can, even in this massive death star, we can say, who can reach the component that holds uh, cardholder data? So how do we go about it? So the first thing, 
we need, we need to know the shape of our network. And we have these beautiful things called AWS Describe Calls that allows us to build the static representation of a network. So we can do describe calls to get the instances, the ENIs, subnets, route tables, VPC, internet gateways. And this is a complete picture of your network. There is no instance of Joe's hidden desk behind some corner. That's the power of the programmatic representation of the network. This model of the network is your network. And we talked a little bit earlier about these powerful things called SMT solvers. So, and now we wanna answer the question, which instances are reachable from the internet? So we can just take our network and give it to the SMT solver, right? Sounds straightforward, they're clever things, we just do that. But the SMT solver's like, wait a minute, what are these things you're telling me? An SMT solver doesn't even know what an internet is, let alone know about VPC networking. All an SMT solver knows about is math. It knows about integers and strings and bit vectors. So how do we bridge this gap between AWS networking and math? So what's the secret sauce? Since SMT solvers don't understand anything about VPCs, CIDRs, or subnets, we need to somehow create this world of VPCs, CIDRs, and subnets into this world of graphs, integers, bit vectors, things that an SMT solver can understand. So how do we do, go about doing it? Here, here's the network we built earlier. We start saying, this, can, can we create a graph out of this? And the, the answer is yes. So how do we go about doing it? We create these nodes for these instances that we have. These in instances are connected to ENIs. Traffic from these ENIs are connected to the subnet. Our subnet is connected to a route table. You can see a graph forming. The route table communicates with the internet gateway. Our internet gateway is the, is the way to get to the internet. Again, we have traffic flowing from the internet gateway to the VPC that connects back to the subnet. So this is now starting to look like a graph that our SMT solver can understand. But there is a little bit more. There's these edges between these nodes, and that's where the symbolic part comes in. This is what allows us to do all possible values without ever having to send a concrete packet. So there is a condition on this that says the traffic from this VPC can only flow to the subnet if the destination address is within the CIDR block range. And now this is the symbolic representation, this value, this constraint. That's it. No, there are no other concrete values flowing through this edge. Let's look at another example. Here it says the traffic, how this traffic can flow between the subnet and an ENI. Well, the destination address has to be a specific value. And for the security group, there's an additional constraint that says that the source address has to be within a certain specific CIDR block range. Now that we have a representation of our network as a graph with these symbolic constraints, we also need to encode our question into, into something that the SMT solver can understand. So if we take, hey, can I SSH into instance A from the internet? What does it look like as a question? It's these values that the destination port has to be 22, the source port has to be greater than 1024, and the protocol is TCP, and that there exists a path in the graph that goes from the internet to instance A. So now we can say, ask the SMT sol solver this question, because it's in a form that it understands. It's in a graph, math, integers, and it says, yes, there does exist a path from the internet. It gives you concrete values to say, how can it get it? So while you, it never needed concrete values, it gives you a concrete value back to show you how it's feasible, how it's possible. And it also tells you what's the path in the graph to show you how it's reachable. So let's look at a couple more examples to see what the types of questions we can ask Teros. So here are two subnets, A and B. The ACL on subnet A denies all traffic destined to the side range of subnet B. 
while the ACLs for subnet B allow all traffic, ingress, egress. And we, we asked Chiros, can an instance in A connect to instance in B? What do people think? No, because it evaluates it all symbolically. It says there can never be a TCP handshake that can never be established. It's because subnet A's ACLs will drop all the packets that are destined for the CIDR ranges in subnet B. In the same setup, let's ask another question. Can an instance in A use an instance in B to NAT to the internet? It can because the packets from A that are not destined for B are not blocked by the ACLs, are not blocked by A's ACLs. So there's, it's, these are simple networks, but as you start to combine them, you want definitive answers. Here's a classic load balancer sending traffic with multiple ENIs. If some of these ENIs block traffic, can the instances still, still receive traffic? This was a trick question, it depends. Because classic load balancers always send traffic through ENI zero. So if ENI zeros are not blocked, the instances can still receive traffic. However, in this case, Tiros will say, mm, no, because uh, ENI zero blocks the traffic. So what's the recipe for the secret sauce? How did we build the secret sauce? We hire formal methods experts, and we put them in a room with EC2 documentation. Because how do we transform AWS into math? Is by saying, hey, smart people who understand, how, who understand AWS networking and understand math, create that transform function that allows, us to, allows SMT solvers to understand it. And they, they do it. They transform the documentation into a logic specification. And they encode VPCs and subnets and side ranges into math. And that is the secret sauce, encoding AWS into math. So if that's the one takeaway folks take from this talk, like how does automated reasoning help in security? How does it do the things? It encodes AWS into math. So now that we have productionized the secret sauce, we can take any network, given the secret sauce, which is the logic specification, we give it to an SMT solver and, and can ask questions, which instances are reachable from the internet? And now the SMT solver will just generate the list of instances that are reachable without ever sending a single packet. It only looks at the formula that gets generated. So if people wanna know more about the actual secret sauce, the entire recipe, they can go read uh, our technical paper on the details of how the encoding actually occurs. So a natural question might be, do I have to be one of these nut jobs that Eric was talking about to, to be able to use Tiros? And the answer is no. You can go today to Amazon Inspector, simple as that, click on Get Started, and it'll give you a bunch of network assessment. These network assessment are driven by Tiros. You can say, hey, I just wanna run them weekly, and you'll, you'll get an assessment template where you can configure what you want, label your findings, configure your rules, your SNS notifications. It'll give you a bunch of findings. And here's a finding that says, hey, port 22 is reachable from the internet. And it'll give you a recommendation how you can remediate it, how you can resolve this finding. You can click on this security group, which will take you to the VPC console, and you'll see, oh, my security group, you know, it allows access from everywhere. Well, you can, you can edit it and have it be that it only allows access from just your VPC. And now you can go rerun your analysis and the finding will go away. So it's as easy as that for using Tiros. Now you may want to use it in a more continuous setting. You can trigger inspector based on CloudWatch event changes to your VPCs, your security groups, ACLs, and you know, 
have Inspector rerun on these CloudWatch notifications. You can, you can assign your own Lambda functions to do remediations. And now you have an end-to-end -end workflow. You can use the power of automated reasoning without ever having to even talk to a nerd or a logician. There's even compliance use cases. You can use uh, Tiros to check uh, network controls for a compliance. For example, you can check the inbound and outbound traffic to cardholder data. And are, are they appropriately restricted? So Eric talked a little bit about how networks aren't special. And while we don't quite get into electrical systems yet, we did talk, in addition to reasoning about networks, we also reasoned about access control policies. And we want to see, can we recreate the, essentially the template for the secret sauce for access control policies as well? And similar to networks, in the early days before cloud, it was, it was actually really hard to answer the question, who has access to what? You had a variety of controls, file system permissions, were used to delegate access to local data and control it, while database credentials were used to restrict who, like which your set of privileged users were. And you had to know about all the different mechanisms that you used for access control, think about it, and devise different tools for it. In the cloud, you have this single model, the AWS IAM model, that allows you to securely control access to all your different types of resources. And here's just a very simple weather application. And a single language allows you to govern ac access to your S3 buckets, your API gateway, your Lambda function, your DynamoDB. And the delegation of permissions is also handled by that same uniform permissions model. Also, everything is accessible via the APIs. Everything. There is no access control hidden under Jill's desk either. So here's an example policy language. And the policies tell you who is granted what type of access to what resources. And it's, it's a combination of allow and deny statements. And the only way you grant somebody access is by explicitly, explicitly saying, hey, this person has access to my resources. So now you have this wonderful unified permissions model. It means there's policies everywhere. You can attach permissions to your organizations, to your users, your S3 buckets, KMS key, Lambda functions, SQSQ, SNS topics. We can keep going on. And you still want to answer the question, did I grant the permissions I intended? And we'll just take, like, we could probably try a policy language looks Policies look small, so we can say, hey, how about we just try to brute force it, maybe fuzz it, since, since Eric loves fuzzing, we can try to fuzz it. Like, what's the space we are looking at? Like, we have accounts, users, resources, actions, IP addresses, VPCs, refers. What's the state space? We have, you know, 12-digit account IDs. This is back of the envelope. I mean, this is not even taking into account federated principles or anonymous users. And we start coming to these numbers, and this is a big number. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I mean, we can dispute it, but I, I would say this is a big number. So we built another service, Zalkova. It allows us to do symbolic analysis of AWS access control, access control policies. And it allows us to answer questions like, Hey, can, this, can user Bob launch EC2 instances outside the US? Can, can, can Jill delete files from my bucket? Can anybody outside my account even access files in my bucket? Is this admin user required to use two-factor auth? And as you can see, there's a theme here. We, we've been talking about these SMT solvers. So let's, let's ask an SMT solver, can user Bob delete files from my bucket? The SMT solver is back in that same quandary. It doesn't know what a bucket is. It doesn't know what a resource is, what an action is. It's back to the same problem. And in fact, we, we say, well, 
why but policies like does policy even look like math i'm actually going to say policies the way it's written it's very straightforward to transform them into a graph into math and if you look at the structure of a request they have to ensure that they don't match a deny statement and match at least one of the allow statements that's the normal structure it's just a conjunction over the denies and a disjunction over the allows. It's a very straightforward logic representation. And you can transform that into a graph. Here, each statement in your policy becomes a node in the graph. Well, the order doesn't matter. And all you have to do is look for a path from, that gets you to an access allowed statement. So here we said, oh, we're gonna have the two things that do not, you know, don't match the deny, as well as match some allow. And the way we had a symbolic packet flowing through a VPC, here you have a symbolic request. You're not actually generating request context, concrete request context. It's just a symbolic one. And there's more details that are added to the graph. For, for each of these edges, there's like, you have, oh, it, it has to be a principle of one, two, three that can perform the get object action and on this resource. And the actual complexity of this graph will start to mimic that that you saw of a VPC network. We've gotten clever now. Something that worked for us earlier, we, we said, hey, we're gonna hire you know, formal method nerds, put them in the, this room, this time with IAM documentation, and they transform IAM documentation into a logic specification. Again, the key here is encoding AWS into math. That was our key takeaway. How, how, why does it work? How does it work? By encoding AWS into math, the secret sauce. And now, if, given that we have the secret sauce for IAM, we can say, hey, can user Bob delete files from my bucket, give it to the SMT solvers? And the SMT solvers say, no, that's just not feasible. Again, want to dig more, learn more about how this can be done. There's a paper that goes through all the, how the actual encoding happens, how we transform all the different parts of the policy language into math. So what does it allow us to do? Now that we have the service, where, how can it transform what we do currently? So one of the key things is we, we want to operate securely at speed. So how do we balance developer freedom with administrative control? So we'll just take a simple use case. Suppose you have a bunch of S3 buckets that you only want to be accessible from a certain set of accounts at most. One way would be to have a dedicated security team review all the bucket policies before they're deployed. Just hire the best security experts. And that would creep us secure, but would really limit our speed. At the other end of the spectrum, you could just have developers deploy policy willy-nilly. That, that would give us a lot of speed, but less security. And how, we can use tools like Zelkova to help us overcome this gap between or this uncomfortable trade-off that we have between speed and security. So you can go today to the AWS config manage rules. If you search for Zalkova, you'll get a list of rules that are powered by the engine. And for the use case we've been just talking about, there is a specific one called S3 bucket policy not more permissive. And what does it allow you to do? It allows you to define a parameter that states that this is a control policy. And this control policy is a specification on your upper bound of the permissions you want your buckets to have in your organization. And this is not an access control mechanism. So if you attach policies that are less permissive than the control policy, you're fine. Everything's great. The, deploy, the developers can just go ahead and deploy their policies. However, if the policies are more permissive than your control policies, then they're not compliant. Maybe there is a business reason for it, but that's something that you'd want the security team and the developers to look at and figure out, is it needed, is it not, should it, should it be changed? Zelkova is also used to power the public, not public badge in the S3 console. It provides you instant visibility into what's the state of your bucket. Are you hosting something that's public? If not, turn on block public access. Uh, we, we partnered with S3 last year to, to release it. And we want everybody, everybody, except people who are doing web-based assets, to turn it on. 
And you can do it for existing buckets. You can go through all of your buckets that are not allowed, that, that shouldn't have public access and just enable this option. You can enable uh, block public access at an account level. And the reason for doing it at an account level is you're essentially locking down public access for every S3 resource, object, and bucket now and in the future. This is incredibly powerful. This is future proofing. Any S3 resource created in the account will not be public any time in the future with block public access turned on at the account level. So at AWS, a primary measure of our success is the experience of our uh, customers. And we do have some exciting announcements coming, uh, coming up this week, so do stay tuned. Uh, before I hand it off to Eric, I want to leave you with this. Uh, we measure the results of automated reasoning in the stories of how our customers are benefiting from it. And this is uh, Bridgewater Associates talking about how they're using Tiros and Zalkova to verify that their security controls are working as they expect them to. Back to Eric. So, I mean, the, the nut jobs came, they took over, they started releasing tools, yet I'm still standing here. I've got an Amazon badge in my bag. I'm not actually wearing it right now. But why, why does the company keep paying me if we've got these awesome tools? Uh, automated reasoning is not cheap. One of the, the awesome things about the cloud is the fact that we capture things via APIs, via a formal specification. And so the ability to apply automated reasoning to that formal specification is, is unique among the systems I've worked on. If you look at a typical application deployed across a bunch of physical or virtual machines, spread out across a number of physical data centers, it's very hard to capture that amount of state in a formally specified way. And if you did, by the time you captured it, something would have changed and you'd have to go back and capture it again. Um, and so it, it's only economical to apply it here, to hire these people with these unusual skills, and to spend a lot of time digging deep to make sure that the model that they've constructed actually matches the behavior of our APIs as implemented, if you can scale that out across a large number of customers of use cases of applications. Um, automated reasoning is it's just straight computer logic. It is completely lacking in common sense. It will never understand your business objectives. It will never make good judgment calls. It will never handle an escalation in the middle of the night. And so maybe Tiros tells you that some access is denied or allowed, but is that the right thing to do? You know, we're sitting here in Las Vegas on Cyber Monday, uh, making a sudden change to an access control policy may be a career-ending move. Um, no one's going to fire Tiros, but you really want to have a human that understands business context engaged here and making sure that critical changes are exactly what should happen. And I love this quote from George Box. Every single thing that we do with automated reasoning is done in some model. And all models are approximations of the underlying reality. And so uh, a couple hours from now, I'm giving a talk on Spectre and Meltdown. These were the, the first of a, a long string of side channel attacks. And the, the key realization of Spectre and Meltdown is that the processors that we all use every day have behaviors that we did not predict. They are not included in the architectural specification of that processor. And they were not considered when we modeled the behavior of those processors. And so coming out of Spectre and Meltdown, uh, in addition to a whole bunch of security remediation, we've had to go reassess our model of how we think about computation and the data that is accessible on a processor. And so this is one of the ways that automated reasoning is not a panacea. And so AR, automated reasoning, is not the entire answer. But it is remarkable how far these nut jobs have gotten. Like they showed up and they made a whole bunch of outrageous statements that were completely unsupportable, but they've actually gone and implemented tools and gotten them into the hands of our customers and demonstrated that at least some of them were actually supportable. One of my favorite things about working with the automated reasoning team is that in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And taking a bunch of logicians who have an elegant proof that this is the right tool to build and then having them meet customers 
and have to actually build real world engineering systems and to, to have to sully themselves with the code that the rest of us have been living with for years has been an awesome and eye-opening learning experience. But in all seriousness, it has been an excellent partnership. We've been able to accomplish things that we would not have been able to accomplish otherwise. And the fact that we have managed to build tools that in the hands of an expert can do amazing things and in the hands of a novice can still do remarkable things that wouldn't be possible otherwise is amazing. And so I'm sold. There's a whole bunch of talks and trainings and whatnot going on this week. Uh, I welcome you to dig into any or all of these. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today. And every session ends with this slide, but it is an honest request. We are a customer-driven company. We value your feedback. We'd like to know what you liked and didn't like about this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>